introductory notes, but since I've done them 10 times already, I think I could wing it. <laughs> I am Robin Schwartz. I'm the program and grant director of the Community Arts Partnership of Tompkins County. And Spring Rights is just one of our programs and services. We also do grant programs, networking events. We have a gallery. We do the Greater Ithaca Art Trail, um, maybe the Ithaca Artist Market next year, and generally serve the artists and arts organizations and audiences in Tompkins County. I'm going to put our website address up in the chat. It's artspartner.org. Um, I want to thank our sponsors for this event, Ithaca College, Wegmans, the Odyssey Bookstore, m and Bank, and the Marriott in Ithaca. And I also want to thank New York State Council on the Arts and Poets and Writers also supported this event. Um, there are three events after this. This is the panel, How Books Make a Person on the Pleasures and Pitfalls of Reading to Write. And then after that, there's a reading. There will be, I hope, five or seven to 10 minute breaks in between each session, uh, four o'clock, uh, a group reading, five o'clock, a panel, succeeding in an alternate universe, the pros and cons of independent presses and self-publishing. And at 6.15, a reading and event with Bob Prohl in conversation with Tom Dunn. Uh, if anyone on this call can think about donating to the Community Arts Partnership, we definitely need funds this year. And if you could be a supporter, that would be amazing. I will put the link into the chat. So that is it. Let's put our panelists up on the screen. And I know that Amy Reading is going to start and introduce everybody. So. All right. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. Hello, and welcome to How Books Make a Person. I'm your host, Amy Reading. And yes, my last name is an actonym. Long before I became a writer, I was a reader. And that part of my identity precedes almost everything else about me. And I've really always been ravenously curious about how writing, sorry, how reading figures into other people's lives, other people's identities, and especially um, other writers' lifestyles. So I'm incredibly excited to have these three writers arrayed before us. I'm gonna introduce each one of them and then we'll dive in with uh, questions. But I encourage all of you to put any questions you might have in the chat and we'll try to get to them toward the end of the panel. So in alphabetical order, we start with Leslie Daniels. She is the author of Cleaning Nabokov's House. Oh, of course, it's all backwards a charming, feel-good, funny novel set right here in Ithaca, which lasts in your mind because of the protagonist's deep connections to her loved ones and the very absurd lengths she is willing to go for them. The novel was published in five languages and optioned for film, and we'd be watching it right now if it weren't for COVID. Leslie's stories and essays have appeared in Plowshares, The Missouri Review, New Ohio Review, and Stone Canoe, among others. She is on the faculty of Spalding University's MFA in Writing program. And she's currently working on an achingly beautiful, heartbreaking memoir and essays, which I can't wait to land in readers' hands. Next, we have Soraya Khan. She is the author of three novels, Noor, Five Queens Road, and City of Spies, which I just loved. It's a coming of age story about a young girl finding her place in Pakistan in the 1970s, which has the raw authenticity of a memoir and the structural formal beauty of a novel. City of Spies received the Best International Fiction Book Award from the, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Sharjah International Book Fair. Soraya was awarded a Fulbright and received a Malahat Review Novella Prize for what became City of Spies. Her work has appeared in Guernica, Long Reads, The Kenyan Review, North American Review, and Journal of Narrative Politics, among other places. I was very excited to learn that she is also at work on a memoir because City of Spies made me want even more. Last but not least, we have Josh Swiller, author of the best-selling memoir, The Unheard, A Memoir of Deafness and Africa, which is a funny, suspenseful, and rather action-packed story of joining the Peace Corps and going to a remote and dangerous province of Zambia, where he succeeded in finding a place where his deafness wouldn't matter, but other complications ensue. 
His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Washingtonian Magazine. His short story, Suddenly the Apocalypse, won a national short fiction contest. And his essay, I Think I Hear You, won the Article of the Year Award from the Washington Society of Professional Journalists. He has a brand new novel, which I can't show you because I don't have my hands on it yet. It comes out the day after tomorrow, called Bright Shining World. Congratulations, Josh. Thank you. Um, and he will be launching his book on December 3rd at 7 p.m. on Zoom with Buffalo Street Books. And our very own Leslie Daniels will be talking to him about it. So you can go to buffalostreetbooks.com to order the book and or register for that event. So let's dive into some questions. Um, and I thought we could just start at the very beginning. I wanted to ask you, what kind of reader were you as a kid? And when did you first think that you might want to try your hand at this? Was there a particular book or a genre, a kind of book? Who would like to begin? I'll start. Uh, I have um, a wonderful mother, who some of you may know, and she's a child psychologist. She's a child developmentalist. And her memory of my reading is that I would stand when I was very little, stand with reading a book on the edge of the bed. And I may have been toilet trained at that point, but my concentration on the book was so total that I would simply ignore, pee and keep reading. And I think maybe that's not the nicest example to come up with to start this off, but reading for me was an experience of immersion, if you'll forgive that. Um, to liquids coming together, but an immersive experience that was unlike anything else. And it still is. That's all I need. <laughs> I'll jump in here. Uh, um, you know, first things, it's great to be in this panel with so many distinguished authors. Uh, but one thing about me is that um, I grew up deaf. Um, I, I have a cochlear implant now, so I hear better than I ever have. But back when I was a child, I had a hearing aid, hearing aids, and didn't hear as well. And so I learned language through my eyes. I didn't learn it through radio, through TV, through overheard conversation, but just through reading. Uh, uh, and also the curse words that my brothers taught me. But I, uh, I started... I think very young, my parents say I was three years old and they started reading. And I basically read everything I could get my hands on until I made a mistake when I was nine years old where um, I, I read a book because it had this really uh, enticing, fabulous, bright yellow cover. And the book was called Portnoy's Complaint, which you shouldn't read when you're nine years old. And after that, I became a more discerning weaver, reader, but uh, that's how I started. Well, in, in terms of my um, relationship to reading, I always liked books, but I, I guess I wasn't very discerning. I used to uh, read Tintin when I was growing up and Archie comic books and um, Enid Blyton, which was a, a detective kind of um, series. But my mother was an avid reader and our house was full of books and her books spilled into my sister's, my sister and I shared a bedroom and her books spilled into the bookshelves in our room. And um, when I was very, when, when I must have been maybe 11, 10 or 11, when I picked up one of her books, which turned out to be a James Baldwin book, which was just completely by coincidence, a book called uh, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone. I guess it's not one of his more famous ones. And I remember reading that, not really understanding what I was reading, but having in that book affirmed for me that books hold worlds. And I knew then that books moved me in a way that nothing else did. But I didn't really come back to that until I was older. And now when I look back, I think that book was very meaningful to me, but I have not dared read it again because I don't want to destroy that memory I have of it. <laughs> so, yeah. I think as far as starting writing, um, I, I mean, I'm older than a lot of people here and uh, we wrote letters and letters were very important to me. And this idea that you have a specific audience for writing 
was very uh, important to me. Um, and then I wrote my dreams. I never journaled, but I wrote my dreams down. And it wasn't until um, I started writing for theater, I started writing monologues and um, wrote a play that I, uh, I started to think this is worth doing as a thing. Uh, up until that point, I think I was very, very happy to read other people's stories and I didn't feel any need to add my own voice to the fray. I also, I think, felt like my own internal life was weird enough and um, fractured enough that it didn't really lend itself to uh, fiction, Not certainly not the kind of fiction I, I, um, I, I liked. Uh, which was orderly fiction. So there's definitely something to be said for the book that we read, but we're not really supposed to read, or we're not technically ready for the Portner's complaint. Mm -hmm. My equivalent would be Flowers in the Attic. I just like to give a shout out to that series. So trashy. Um, but then what about a book that you should have read, but didn't? A book that, you know, you didn't encounter um, and you wish you had, or maybe even a book that wasn't published yet. Is there a book that you now know you would have loved or a book that you would like to send back to your childhood self? And I want to know the book. And then I also want to know what would be different about the ensuing life? How would that change you? How would that put you on a different path or maybe even change you as a writer? Well, I think um, it's a tricky question because if I found the right book, I think I would have been satisfied and not have to become a writer or a writer in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think a lot of people become writers because there's a feeling there's something that doesn't fit, something maybe broken, something that feels incomplete and they're trying through writing to make it complete. Um, so one book that really struck me that I read, I think when I was about 20, uh, was, and there was Light by Jack, Jack Hughes, uh, Lucy Oran, who's a, um, he was a French resistance um, fighter in World War II who had gone blind when he was a child. And so he wrote this incredible memoir about how he became a leader of the resistance because he could just feel where other people were at because he couldn't see them. And, and it was, to me, it was just such a remarkable thing about, um, uh, yeah, what's inside is valuable. What's inside has worth. What's inside can create something amazing, which was um, uh, uh, inspiring. And uh, until that point, I, I hadn't been able to, kind of verbalize what it was I was looking for in a way. And with that book, I felt, ah, I sort of get it. So that's one book. There are many, of course. I mean, there's so many books that you just, you know, you just drop them at your feet where you're standing and go, wow, <laughs> how they know, how they know what I was feeling in my heart right now. Um, a book you would send back in time? For me, I had a hard time thinking about that book, but then I, I think that um, the book that I would send back to my childhood self, which was not around at that time, is a book called Harun and the Sea of Stories, which is a childhood, uh, a children's book, basically, uh, by Rushdie, Salman Rushdie. And it's a book that we discovered when we, when we had our children. And there is a rhythm and a joy to the language in that book. And a, even though it's a fantastical story, it's a fairy tale, uh, it is also filled with names and places that sound, that are not, of course, familiar to me, but certainly sounded familiar to me now. And for my children, too, that was important that we offer that. Uh, to them. I grew up in Pakistan. I'm from Pakistan. And I never read any, any books that were set in Pakistan that had names like mine, um, that had a kind of rhythm to the language that I heard about me. And so now when I look back and I think that would have been a fantastic book to get. And in terms of whether it, or how it might have changed me, I'm not sure because I think that we meet 
different books in our lives for different reasons. And then even if we read them again later, they do different things for us. But so I'm not entirely sure, except to say that it might have validated um, my later need to write about places that are unfamiliar, at least, to where I live now. I would think for me, um, it, I, I, was, I was thinking that I would say Juna Barnes, Nightwood, because I didn't discover that until my sort of deep 20s. And it was something somebody said, here, you have to read this. And again, it was, it was a tremendously voice-driven book. And up until that point, I don't think I'd seen how that, was, how that could work. Um, but then, then after that, maybe Toni Morrison, which is the same thing. It's just like that the experience is so immersive and so disturbing in a way that uh, it had none of the tidiness of the books I read in my childhood. And that to me was revelatory. So maybe like Nightwood and um, The Bluest Eye, maybe. So for me, the book would be um, The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman, which just wasn't written when I was little. Um, and my solution to that inability to twist time is to you know, shove that book down the throats of my children, which of course <laughs> I'm sure that they don't like it. And actually, Soraya, the same thing with I Wrote in the Sea of Stories. I mean, that wasn't, it didn't function for me in the same way as it did for you, but I love that book, shared it with my kids. They were completely indifferent. So there's there's just always a kind of perennial mismatch, right, between desire and fulfillment. And like Josh said, um, you know, if you could magically plug that hole, then maybe you wouldn't need to be a writer. So I think there is something about writing and reading toward a certain kind of book that uh, never gets fulfilled, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, so I, I, let's tease out that idea some more. I don't know, that's my, that's my working theory. Um, so when you're writing a particular book, are you reading at the same time in that genre? So all of you have written novels and have written or are writing memoir. Um, as you're working on a given manuscript, are you reading other books like the book that you're working on or do you specifically avoid them? Um, and so how does reading influence your writing and how does writing influence your reading in the moment as you're feeding your creative life? Well, for me, I, I am always reading in the genre that I'm writing in. Um, I can't imagine actually not reading a novel, right? I couldn't give that up uh, no matter what I was writing, what whatever I'm writing, but I also read in multiple genres all the time. So I feel like I have two streams going. One stream that's sort of directed by the research that I might be doing for the novel that I'm working on. And then also a different stream that maybe isn't connected to that, that are, that, you know, there, I have a line of a uh, list of books that I'm interested in reading. So I've got two things going on at the same time. And I, I feel sometimes that it doesn't matter what I'm reading, that I, there's always something to be learned from what I'm reading and there's some excitement or some possibility that opens up for me, even if I'm reading in a different genre that has nothing to do with my own uh, interests as a writer. That's just how, I mean, that's just how I feel like I read and write. I don't know how you feel about that? I, I often uh, am petrified that somebody's written the book already. So I pick up a book and I kind of gingerly open it like, oh God, somebody got there first. And then it's like, nope, they didn't. It's their own thing. And uh, that's usually uh, delightful to, to realize, yeah, I, I may have good company on this path, but nobody's walking in my steps. And um, I think sometimes, I mean, I often tell my students this, that you know, they'll back away from books that are too hard and they feel are too hard. And I think sometimes there are times when you can really stretch yourself as a reader. And there's sometimes when you need um, 
comfort and familiarity. And I think rereading is not to be underestimated when you're working on something, because it's very often when you're rereading something, you can see, you can look under the hood better. You can see, oh, I see what he was doing here. I see, you know, how she foreshadowed this or, or braided these themes together. So you can think about structure in a way when you're rereading something that you, you can't, when you read it for the first time, you're just swept up in the experience of it. I think, um, well, I think as a writer, I'm always looking for inspiration. So if I find a good book, it doesn't matter where I am in the writing process. But definitely in the early stages of a writing process, I can get um, distracted if I'm reading a book that's too beautiful, that has language that's almost too good, you know, like poetry or, or some of these really imagistic writers like Dennis Johnson or something you get, I can get sucked into worrying about sentences. So I do try to stay away from those books in early drafts, and maybe like read some thrillers and see how they're plotted, see how they're put together. Uh, and then in, in later drafts, I, like, I definitely gravitate towards writers who are uh, really just playing with language, um, uh, just going to unexpected little places in the form of a story. And, and that helps a lot with uh, putting the finishing touches in. Well, another way to um, pop open the hood and see how it's done is to read a book that does it poorly. I'm wondering how often you hate read you guys have been very nice so far, <laughs> but surely not all of your reading is motivated by inspiration and beauty. What is the worst book you've ever read that has made you a better writer? Um, I'll just jump in. Uh, I don't know the worst book I ever read, but uh, I had a spiritual teacher who once said, and he was oversimplifying, but he once said, the point of spiritual practice is to have a sense of humor. And, and so when I'm reading books by authors who have a really misanthropic and sour view of the world, I start to feel like, why, why are you even writing it? And by a sense of humor, it doesn't mean it has to be laugh a minute, but there can be a sense of play, a sense of uh, just enjoying the process of sharing what's inside you with someone else. And so I remember uh, I, I was in the Peace Corps and I stumbled on a stack of books by Paul Thoreau and V.S. Nepal. Um, and they wrote about Africa and they were friends and they were just, every book was just, boy, life sucks. Or boy, people are terrible. And uh, I don't know if you're going to, if you're going to think hard about life and that's the end we're going to come to, I don't know, I'll pass on that. So those are the books I find myself hate reading, I guess. This question stumped me completely. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you gave it to us in advance and I thought about it and this, I just, I cannot come up with um, a book that I hated that I learned something from except to try and not do whatever that book does um, to make sure that I don't do that. but really, this stumps me. <laughs> I love that. That tells a lot about you as well. That's, that's interesting because I have a very long list of books that I can answer for that question. But do you finish books that you don't hate? I mean, you know, no, that's kind of most frequently. No, I don't. But sometimes I do. And, um, and sometimes, you know, it's just fueled by a ah, competition or, or, you know, a sort of reverse kind of inspiration. But other times it feels so I'm at the moment writing a biography and it's very useful to read occasionally, not a steady diet, but occasionally biographies that, that are just much more pedantic than I want to be in order to see how it happens and see how they handle the research. And, you know, I can get a lot from it while not enjoying the reading experience. So it's, it's a kind of research. It's a kind of, right. even a kind of play because, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking it seriously. I'm, I'm bouncing myself against this book. Um, but I don't, I don't do that very often, but 
You do. Um, <laughs> I have lots of answers to this question. I, <laughs> I don't, as Amy knows me pretty well. <laughs> and um, I won't finish a book, but I, I will, you know, at the throw it across the room moment, I will, you know, just abandon it. Uh, but I, I was thinking about when, you know, my book has some amount of passion in it. And it came out not too long before Fifty Shades of Grey. And my agent said, you know, you gotta, you gotta write a review of Fifty Shades of Grey. And uh, I, so <laughs> I wrote like, this is the first book that I've ever read that made me wanna run outside and apologize to a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I never got published anywhere. But that was kind of, but I was thinking about like Elizabeth Gilbert. I'm not going to say terrible things about Elizabeth Gilbert, but well, I, you know, no, I'm not. Um, a lot of people liked Eat, Pray, Love. I was an agent at the time when Eat, Pray, Love, I was a literary agent when that book came out and every single one of our clients wanted to write that book. It's like, no, no, me, give me a hundred thousand dollars and I will write, you know, think, run, fuck. That's my book. That's what I want. And it was just like, it was the worst as far as dealing with other artists and their ideas about creativity. Because basically, yeah, they should all have $100,000 and go travel around the world and write something amazing. But that's not how publishing works. And so when she wrote a book on creativity, and, you know, I feel very strongly like, like Josh does about spirituality and humor and, and kindness. And I think writers need inspiration. People look to, you know, you read a book on creativity and you want hope. And um, so Elizabeth Gilbert writes a book on creativity. So I'm going along with it. And it, up until this point where she says that ideas are like a thing. I keep admitting people, by the way, Robin, um, ideas are a thing and you have to write the book that you want to write because otherwise if you don't, this idea is going to go in the next frame and get in Josh's head. You know, that's what an idea is. And I thought, you know, that's not true. It's just simply not true. I mean, yes, everybody should write their books, but I thought here's someone who really has a position where people are going to listen to her about creativity and she's basically shoveling poop and it's, it's not okay. So, so that book I had a real problem with. I'm, I'm sorry to be the scatological one here. I thought you'd all <laughs> join me, but clearly I'm alone. As I'm usual. That you noted that for us all instead of me having to point that out. But, but I thought the question was that books that we have problems with that we learn something from. There are plenty of books that I hate, but then I'm trying to figure out what do I like about them? So <laughs> there's no redeeming, was there anything redeeming about that, uh, about uh, the, the creativity book? Well, it, it makes me want to write it better. Ah, I right. believe that um, there's a hunger to talk about where you find creativity and how That's it works right. for you. And I'm always fascinated I mean, I would be fascinated by, by you, Soraya. How do you keep going? I mean, I wouldn't ask you like, where do you get your ideas? But the, the elements of how you trigger yourself and how you stay inspired would be endlessly interesting to me. And that's, and you too, Josh, and God knows you, Amy. I mean, those are things that would enrich my life if I knew them. But if you, if you tell me some cockamamie pseudoscience about ideas are like mosquitoes. No, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree with everything you said there. Uh, uh, and, you know, in a way, what I learned from writers like Elizabeth Gilbert um, is there's a lottery aspect to this, that the books that make it aren't the best books. Uh, and, and in a way, I find that freeing because uh, um, sometimes uh, at writing you can get stuck into this idea I have to make this so perfect or else it's not going to work 
And then you read Fifty Shades of Grey or you just look at it and sense what's inside of it and you know that's not the case, that it's not um, uh, about crafting perfection. And in a way I find stuff like that frees me up to just do what I want instead of some idea of what I think will work. And uh, so I, I often get that from uh, terrible books that are on the bookseller list. Um, but I also feel that a lot of these authors who we kind of um, unfortunately might look down on who are always on the bestseller list, they have my admiration. I feel they're more business people than writers, but like that Nora Roberts sits down in the chair, cranks out three books a year for 30 years, which I've not read a page of, I still think that's amazing. And uh, there's something just to be learned from the, the, the discipline these people have or, or the disciplined people they have working for them. Uh, and so yeah, I appreciate that, that the ones who um, uh, are maybe not the, the greatest artists are just churning them out. And that's a skill there. I like what you said, Josh, this idea that the books that are published are not necessarily the books that are the best. I mean, I think we know publishing isn't really a meritocracy. And the flip side of that might be that there are some very good books that aren't published, right? That, there, that there's this um, mismatch between um, the books that are out there and the books we need. And I'm just going to lay my cards on the table here. Like, I am very interested in places where reading where there's a mismatch or a disconnect or a cognitive distance between what we need and what we read or what we write and what we read. Um, so that's going to shape some of my questions for each of you. Um, and I have some sort of specific questions for each of you um, based on your books. I hope you'll indulge me. Um, I wanted to start with you, Josh. Your memoir, I, I wish I could ask you questions about your novel, but I, like I said, it's not out yet. So we're going to go to the, oh yes, you want to show it? There it is, Bright Shining World. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, but temporarily going back in time to your memoir, um, it has many moments, all of which were startling to me when I encountered them, where you deliberately turn off your hearing aids so you, you don't hear. And so oftentimes those moments happen when you're in a dark room or in a room with people who don't speak English so you can't lip read. And you spend two years in a country where you don't speak the language. Um, and throughout the whole book, you're actually fairly despondent about the possibility of communication. So I wanted to read a passage that comes toward the end of the book, where you are, as you put it, back in my long-standing role of the deaf child at the dinner table. And I want to ask you to take the idea that you're expressing in this passage about speaking and hearing, and, and I'm gonna ask you how much does it apply to reading and writing? Um, you say, I wonder what part of ourselves is formed from our communication with others and what part is untouched by it. And where could one find the untouched part? Because it seemed like the untouched part might be able to make sense of the way things played out while the touched part was completely at their mercy. Or maybe I just mean that as much as we want to connect with people, could we ever truly do so? And if we couldn't, and we were all ultimately alone, why do we so desperately keep trying? So my question is, is there an untouched part of ourselves even when we read or does reading and writing, does the written word somehow manage to breach some of that? <laughs> uh, easy question. <laughs> uh, I really, um, like I said, uh, I, I grew up kind of uh, with four senses instead of five. And, and it really made me appreciate what's inside us. And then in a way, do, doing the Peace Corps, going to the Peace Corps, going to Africa was in some ways my last attempt to uh, fix what was outside, fix what was missing inside by going outside. That through some experience, through some um, act, I, I will heal what's inside. Um, and it didn't work. And then uh, I was a Zen monk for years after that. 
And now I'm a cranial sacral therapist. And all, both of those things are really about going inside to what heals us. And it's always there. It's why when we're, you know, getting older, I'm going to be 50 in a couple of weeks. When we're getting older, we feel there's a five-year-old part of us that's still like, how is this happening? And uh, in that part um, is kind of what I'm always writing towards. Uh, and that part is what I'm looking for in authors I love. So I mentioned Dennis Johnson earlier, and he writes these, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he wrote these just beautiful kind of drug adult uh, stories where he used the vehicle of drugs to look at the world in a different way. And, um, but what's striking about him is he never lost touch with that five-year-old, that deep inner child who, who is just, you know, walking around going, wow, you know, there are clouds, there's trees, uh, there's, uh, there's love, there's grace. Uh, and, and so I think a good novel, a good book, a good friend brings you back to that. And not in a way like, you know, an in-your-face preaching way, but in, in, a, in a gentle friendly uh, but uh, unshakable way and so uh, I kind of feel my train of thought has gone in many directions but that's bas basically the gist of, um, uh, of what I, I seek in writing what I seek uh, to, in my experience of writing and what I would like readers to have from uh, reading what I wrote. Um, Leslie, I have a somewhat similar, somewhat different question for you. Um, one would be forgiven for thinking that cleaning Nabokov's house is all about sex. And certainly there's lots of sex in it. It's delicious. It's about women getting some, but I'm here to tell you it's not. It's really on, on you know, that's just a distraction underneath. It's about reading and writing because there are some very consequential acts of both that drive the story along. Um, the protagonist, Barb, like you, lives in a house where Nabokov lived and wrote. And early in the novel, she sits on a bus between Ithaca and New York, and she reads one of my favorite novels, Nabokov's Pale Fire. And she writes, or you write this, she says this, I felt like the book was reading me. Maybe none of his work, but certainly not Pale Fire, contained confirmation of who I was it was all about who I was not. The words took me to the edge of some great unknowing place as if I were staring at the night sky from the crest of the moon. I felt right up against what I didn't know. So then through the action of the novel, which I will not spoil, but which involves writing and sex, Barb comes to understand Nabokov so well that she can amaze a panel of academic literary critics at a conference with what she has understood about him from within his sentences. And you write, I could tell from the silence that lay people weren't supposed to know these things just by reading, but reading is as close as you can get to communing, closer than face-to-face, -face, closer than sharing breath. Sharing breath being something, of course, we can't do nowadays. Um, so my question is, what does it take to come to that level of understanding with another person's work? Um, to, to, to feel as if you're communing? And is it rare for you? I, I, I don't assume that it's automatic. Um, what are the conditions for that kind of communing, given that Barb had to work very hard to get to it for Nabokov? Um, hmm, thank you. It's funny to hear those sentences that I don't remember writing at all. Um, <laughs> it hasn't been that long. Uh, I think, you know, what... What Nabokov does is he entirely thwarts any expectations you can have about what's coming next. I mean, even in the middle of a sentence, you can't know because um, it's so deeply unconventional. And um, that, I, I mean, I, I'm such a terribly boredom averse 
person that, and I, and I've read a, a lot, you know, read my whole life uh, for my own entertainment as well as for work. And there is such a, a sense when I read some things that I just know like how the sentence is going to go and what's going to come next. And it, it isn't a satisfying communion for me uh, if it isn't somehow surprising. Um, and that, you know, that means I, I try and read out of my comfort zone. I don't know. I've forgotten the question. Was that, did I answer it? Sure. Um, okay. Thank Leslie, you. I, re I remember you did a, a workshop uh, a few years ago called Don't Bore Me. Yeah, all of my <laughs> workshops are basically Don't Bore Me. <laughs> Soraya, one of my favorite parts of City of Lies comes when Aliyah teaches herself Urdu. Like you, Aliyah is the daughter of a Pakistani father and a Dutch mother, and she is raised in Vienna where she speaks English. When her family moves to Pakistan, she attends an American school, so she does not speak the native language. She makes a very consequential decision to learn Urdu with the help of her family's servant, Sadiq, and it's their relationship that forms the heart of the book. But Aliyah, this is the fascinating part to me, she keeps her lessons secret from everyone else in her life. No one knows that she can read the newspaper and converse with servants and eavesdrop on conversations. I'm just wondering, because that meant a lot to me as I read your book, is there a parallel in your own life, a connection to secret or private reading or writing? What is the power of privacy in this realm? In this realm, is that what you said? In the realm of reading and writing. I'm not, I don't wanna know all your secrets, as many as you care to divulge. <laughs> um, I don't know, nobody's asked me that uh, question in the context of, of uh, Alia's relationship to learning Urdu, so I have to think about that for a moment. Um, I mean, the reasons why she keeps learning the language as secret are complicated and multi-layered, but much of it has to do with wanting to present herself as a different kind of person and learning the language is a way of getting there, right? Because the book is in some senses a journey uh, of her identity. She's starting off one particular way and then these events happen. And at the end of the novel, she's questioning uh, who she is and her allegiances, because after all, it is a book about uh, allegiances and loyalties. Um, in terms of the parallels with writing, I think I don't know. I mean, I just throw it out there. I, I didn't decide to become a, a writer until much later. I, in fact, went to graduate school for something else. I went to graduate school to study uh, international studies. And it wasn't until I had completed that that I started to think about, no, that's not really what I want to do. Um, and let me see if I can do let me see if I can write. Let me see if I can actually do what really moves me and what has always moved me through my life. Reading books, let me see if I can write a book. Um, but it took me a long time to get there. And it wasn't something that I advertised that I was doing because it's a very, I mean, at least for me, and I know for other writers, it can be complicated to out yourself as a writer because when you say you're a writer, people immediately want to know, you know, so what, you, what have you written? But, you know, you can be a writer before you've actually written something that they may have read. So um, I don't know, that would, I would think that maybe that that's a parallel in my own life. I'm not sure that's what you had in mind. Oh, absolutely. That's just what, comes to my mind right away. Yeah, I think there's a value in holding things close before they're released into the world, especially at the beginning of a project or of a career, so for sure. Especially um, when they're still forming, right? You know, because you don't even really know what you want to say. You don't even know if you have something to say. You don't know if anybody will be interested. It's just so early along, that process, so. And it's more than a job. It's your identity as well. Yeah. Um, so how about a very topical question as we're ending, getting toward the end of the panel. Again, I invite other people to put questions in the chat if you have them, although we are running out of time, but we'll see what we can come up with. Um, so I'm curious about how your 
reading and writing, but mainly your reading has fared during the pandemic. Um, mine, mine hasn't been great. <laughs> My ability to concentrate was shot at the beginning and it felt like I had a concussion and it felt like I had to recover from that in order to muster the ability to concentrate on sentences, paragraphs, chapters, books, um, but it did recover. And then I was reading up a storm, not necessarily liking what I was reading, but but you know there have been definite phases within this pandemic to my reading. So I'm wondering about you and I'm wondering what the best book you've read has been during the pandemic. And I'm wondering what you're most excited about for your entire creative life for after the pandemic is over. I can jump in. Um, I, I can relate to what you said about reading went down. I, I think my low point in reading actually was about uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when uh, I could read a tweet and that was about it and watch election results and read a tweet. And it seemed to go on for a really long time. Uh, but one of the things uh, I've been struck by is we're living in, you know, a kind of dystopian time an unsettling time, a scary time. And in dystopian times, the radical act is to imagine the utopia, to uh, present kindness, to present goodness. So one book, which I hope I'm stealing from Leslie, if she was gonna mention it, one book that really just blew me away with just presenting this hopeful, uh, beautiful take in the middle of just the crazy year this has been, and was Writers and Lovers by Lily King. And, and uh, it was just such a humble, generous book that, you know, was just kind of going, you know, you know, I almost felt the book was patting me on the back while I was reading it. Going, going you're doing a good job. And, and those, I, you know, I've been reading more now, but definitely, uh, I've definitely been um, drawn towards books that have that optimistic, hopeful uh, take, because we need that now. I find that my reading has changed during uh, this time. Not that I stopped reading because um, I can't stop reading. It's just something that I'm compelled to, to do. And actually books have saved me during this time, both other books, but also uh, the pandemic gave me the need really to finish up a revision that I was working on because it was the only way to start concentrating on something else that wasn't the news. So actually it was an opportunity for me in that way. But my reading changed in a sense that I started to listen to audiobooks. I constantly listened to podcasts, but all of a sudden, I think I just ran out of podcasts that I could easily access. So I started to listen to audiobooks, And so for the first time, that's how I read or listened to Anna Karenina. So, um, it, so now I'm just not only reading books, you know, real books, I'm also on my walks, I'm listening to a different book. And I've never really done that before, reading multiple novels at the same time. So I don't know if that's an indication of lack of focus, <laughs> not being disciplined, but um, it has opened up that possibility for me. And Josh, it's funny you should remember, you should um, mention Writers and Lovers because I just finished that book. <laughs> just two days ago, I just finished it. Yeah, everybody read it. Book. <laughs> but I think that the best book that I've read during this time, I mean, that not, doesn't necessarily even speak to this time, except in the way that all books are in conversation with our current uh, moment. And that's the book, I can't remember the author, but I think it's called Say Nothing. It's written about the IRA troubles and um, it is actually a murder mystery, but in that murder mystery, the author is telling us, describing the whole historical moment to us. And um, it's just fascinating and you just cannot put it down. Just amazing. Not, it's nonfiction. You say murder mystery, but it's not. It's not a novel. It's nonfiction. Right? It's nonfiction. Sorry. Yes, it's nonfiction. So I'm just reading fiction and nonfiction, audiobooks and not. So. so I was going to say, Lily King, you're absolutely right, and I was also going to thank Josh for giving it to me because it was 
you know, when a friend gives you a book that you love so much, it's a, it's a, it's an experience of being recognized, which is very precious. Um, so since I can't talk about Lily King, there's a memoir of a fictional character. It's called Becoming Duchess Goldblatt. And it came out uh, this summer. And Duchess Goldblatt is a, is a persona that exists on Twitter. So it's a social media mask of a real person um, who may have been in publishing um, I think she was probably somebody in publishing. I don't think I know who it is, but um, I knew her as a Twitter person and somebody very funny and witty and tender. But the book is about the creation of this fictional self and how a community was built around it and a um, transformation occurs. I don't want to say too much, but I, for me, it was an enormously hopeful vision of how to gain something in a very creative way in this time that is so much about what is being taken away from us. So I, I recommend that heartily right after Lily King, both of those books, you can't go wrong. There, there are, I note that there are questions about agents and how we got started and practical things that I'm, I just think we don't have time for here, but I wanted to acknowledge that there, I don't know if you can see the questions, Amy, but they're, you know, they're, they're good in depth, how to do it stuff that I don't think we have time or space to cover here. Um, so there is one question. Can you repeat the name of your, the book that you just recommended, Leslie? Becoming Duchess Goldblatt. And it's anonymous. It's written by Duchess Leslie. Goldblatt. There's no author. It's it's anonymous. It's um, yeah. It's, it's written by Duchess Goldblatt. Right. Um, I think we are out of time. I think we need to stop there. Josh, were you signaling for airspace? Yeah, I'll, I'll just want to say really quickly about as far as the agents and everything. There's no magic bullet. There's no shortcut. You really just you just have to. Uh, uh, Nora Roberts' famous advice, you just have to put your ass in the chair, ass in the chair, that's it, and do the work. And it took me years to get an agent to look at my book, years to get an agent to accept the book, and then years to get it on from then. There's no shortcut, unless maybe you're Elizabeth Gilbert. So if you love reading, if you love writing, just, just do it for that. And um, the other stuff, nobody knows really. Thank you guys. That was a great, great panel. Amy, thank you so much for, for organizing this and taking so much time with the questions. Thank you for us the occasion. I appreciate it. Thank you. So um, I forgot to say at the beginning that all of these sessions are being taped. And there was a panel uh, a few nights ago on Thursday night about, uh, didn't I write it down? Total Submission, it was about literary magazines and they talked very extensively about agents and letters and rejection and, and, and all of that. So um, there's, a, there's a really, oh, there it is. Um, the panel was Total Submission. Did I say Submersion? Um, understanding the kinks and quirks of literary magazines. And yeah, so, so there's going to be a wealth of wealth wealth of knowledge put up on our website after all of these events